So there's one type of example we didn't cover, which is how to go from a rectangular equation to parametric equations. So we'll take a circle centered at the origin and radius of four. <clears throat> if there is not a specific orientation or a certain t value that I need to have uh, be at a certain x, y value, then there's a lot of freedom to choose your x and y functions. So if there was no specific t values to be at a point, for example, 0, 4, or 4, 0, or 0, negative 4, then I have quite a bit of choice to pick my functions. So I'm just drawing a circle radius 4. So we've got 4 there on the x, 4 on the y, negative 4, negative 4. So this problem did not specify the orientation. So I'm just picking an orientation. I'm picking counterclockwise because that's the way the trig function sine and cosine would normally rotate if I just pick cosine for x, sine for y. I would just naturally get that orientation right there. Let's ori well, I'll, I'll orient this first, and then I'll flip it around. How about that? So if I'm just picking this orientation, the problem didn't say which way. So I'm going to pick x is r cos theta, y is r sine theta. And if I square them, add them together, I'll get x squared plus y squared equals r squared right there. Or you can just write out uh, the radius is 4. So x is 4 cos theta, y is 4 sine theta. Oh, why am I using thetas? Should be using t's right here. All right, so this will work out because my circle equation, if I wrote it out in rectangular coordinates, will be x squared plus y squared equals 4 squared. That's the general form of a circle with the center 0, 0. And now if I take my x and y uh, t functions and plug them in right here, I'll have 4 cos t squared plus 4 sine t squared. So that's 4 squared cos squared t plus sine squared t, and that cancels to just 4 squared. So it works, the one I picked works in my circle equation that I wrote above. I'm just checking to make sure that these two functions of t actually satisfy my rectangular equation of a circle right here. So I plugged them in, reduced it down to 4 squared. All right, so that means I have the parametric equations for the circle. Now, <clears throat> I can plug in some t values. I'm not going to make the table. I'll just list some t values in green here. So when t is 0, I'm just looking at my uh, equations down here, my original x and y equations. When t is 0, x is 4 times cos 0, or 4. y is 4 times sine 0, which is 4 times 0 is 0. So that's my t equals 0 right there at 4, 0. And if I plug in pi over 2, that's another easy t value. Plug in pi over 2, my cosine is 0. So my x-coordinate will be 0. My y-coordinate will be 4 times sine pi over 2, which is 4. So my t equals pi over 2 is at the top. And then you can see it rotates, you know, keep increasing your t value. And I go counterclockwise right here. So that would be the parametric equations for the circle starting at the point 4, 0 and going counterclockwise. Now if I had to go clockwise, what can I do to modify these choices I made to get the orientation reversed? So if I go forwards in time, I'm spinning counterclockwise. What change would I make so I'd be going backwards in time? Negative sign where? On the T. So I'd put it on the T to turn the time backwards. 
So I'll just write this as a CCW for counterclockwise. Now I'll go to the blue and I'll do reverse the T parameter. So reverse the T parameter. So we're going to replace T with negative T. That'll just basically make us spin the wrong direction. So when T increases, it'll have the effect of decreasing the actual inputs. So in this case, 4 cos negative T, Y equals 4 sine negative T. So this would be just fine for a, a system a parametric equations to go clockwise. So that'll spin the other direction. You can do a little bit of algebra. I know the cosine function is even, so cosine doesn't care about the negative in front of the t. Sine is odd, so the sine function I can pull the negative through. So I could rewrite it for cos t and y is negative for sine t. That would be an equivalent system. Question? So uh, if the circle wasn't centered at the origin, how would that change these? So if the circle wasn't centered at the origin, then I have to work quite a bit harder. So let's look at the uh, circle not centered at the origin. Now if your circle is not centered at the origin, it's going to have an ugly equation unless one of the corner points on your circle is the origin. So if I just, for example, move this circle over to any direction, the equation is going to be really ugly when I go to uh, a parameterized version. So I'll do... Let's go circle. Would you just replace the x and y with the same thing, but when you square it, you have to? Well, I'll use the general form of a circle, but I need my radius to equal either my x or y shift so that I hit the origin as I go around the circle. So we'll center this at, uh, let's go 3, 0, and our radius needs to be 3. If you don't, uh, <clears throat> if the circle doesn't hit the origin on one of the corner points, the algebra is really bad. So I'm intentionally picking this circle so that our algebra works out relatively well. It won't be as nice as the last problem, but it should be at least decent. I like to draw the center as like an open dot because it's not really a point on the circle itself. So there's the center. My points are over 3, over 3, up 3, down 3. All right, general form. Who remembers general form of a circle? So we got our offset, our x offset, and our y offset, and that'll be the center coordinates right there. So it's x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals r squared. This is the general form of a circle. No, standard form. Standard form of a circle. And I'm just using a 3, 0. So we have x minus 3 squared plus y squared equals r, r is 3, so equals 3 squared. So now we have to get a little bit creative here. There's probably some algorithm to do this, but the way I'm going to do it is going to be a substitution here. So I know that cos squared plus sine squared equals, or 3 cos squared plus 3 sine squared equals 3 squared. So that's what's in my brain right now. I better use t's also. 3 cos t squared plus 3 sine t squared equals 3 squared. So you just square those out. Factor out your 3 squared, sine squared plus cos squared is 1, et cetera, et cetera. So this is what I'm thinking about right now. 
So any questions about why that's true? What I need to do is take what's in the white marker and turn it into what's over here. So it should be pretty obvious that y is 3 sine t. That's what y is. So I'll do the easy one first. Now, don't think too hard. What I have underlined, x minus 3, is 3 cos t. So I'm replacing x minus 3 with 3 cos t. I need to have an equation that's just x equals, so I just add 3 to both sides. So I have x equals 3 plus 3 cos t, like that. Those are my parametric equations right there. And the way I chose them, if I put in 0 for t, my x will be 6. I better choose a third color. So my x will be 6, my y will be 0. So there's my t equals 0 right there. And then if I plug in pi over 2, that'd be, I'm not making a table of values, so I'm trying to go quickly here. But if I plug in pi over 2, I'll have for my x coordinate will be 3 plus 0, which is 3. My y coordinate will be 3 times 1, which is 3. So that'll be 3, 3. And that puts me at the top of the circle right there. And so I have chosen the orientation that direction right there. Does that answer your question? So try to write out, if, if you're given rectangular either description in words, turn it into a rectangular equation, and then think about, in this case, I just wanted something squared plus something else squared to equal 3 squared. So I just had to figure out what to substitute in. Now it's a little bit trickier if I had a hyperbola. For example, if I had x minus 3 squared minus y squared equals 3 squared, now I have to be a little more creative about which trig identity is going to be this form right here. Uh, you, mm, you could use hyperbolic trig if you really wanted to, but I think this could be accomplished with regular trig. So I think it's something like tangent squared minus secant squared is plus or minus one, something like that. I'd either use a tangent squared or the cotangent squared, depending on which one will work better in this situation. Now it's a little bit weird because when you start with the tan squared t Uh, oops, I think I would need negative 3 on this side, so I'll just change to a negative 3 squared. So I'll subtract secant squared equals negative 1, and then multiply the whole thing by 3 squared to get to something very similar to what I started with right there. So I'm just taking some identities I know about, manipulating them until it gets close to the form I want, and then I make my substitution once you have that form. So it's a really similar process right here. So we're going to get back to areas and lengths. I think we're almost, what did we leave off on? Perimeter. I think we are done. Oh. We got service area left. All right. So I think this is computed to a point where you can finish this off. So I'm just going to leave dot, dot, dot. So we'll just go to the next topic here. When I go to grade your quizzes and your midterms, most of the points are going to be for setup now. I'm going to give, let's say the problem problems out of 10 points, I'll give one or two points for the actual antiderivative at the end. And there may be a few that I set up that are really tricky to solve, and when I give you those problems, uh, I will tell you just set it up. Don't worry about actually solving it, because sometimes the setup is, can be significantly tricky. Arc length is, <coughs> was 
easier before. Now you have to do the, let's see, find r and r prime, square the two, add them together. So arc length takes a little more work than it used to. It used to be one plus derivative squared. Now it's function squared plus derivative of the function squared. So it's a little bit more work now. So now we're going to go to surface areas. And what we're going to be doing is rotating curves. So we're going to rotate a curve into a surface. Oh, I'm reading the wrong page of my notes. Wow. Well, that's actually the last thing in arc length and that perimeter was the last problem in 11.5. So now what we're gonna do is jump all the way to chapter 12. So it's the last thing in chapter 11 we're gonna cover. So ignore surface areas for now. So we're going to do a bunch of three-dimensional geometry first. So this is 12.1. So this will be three-dimensional, 3D. Of course, we're going to write that as R cubed. That means R times R times R. That's 3D. Coordinate systems. So we have a serious issue with drawing in three dimensions. Uh, the real problem is we write in two dimensions and draw in two dimensions and we're about to try to draw a third dimension on a flat piece of paper. So that's a very serious limitation. There really is no way, good way to do that on paper. So we'll just do what I've been doing for quite a while, which is draw a perspective. So our third axis is supposed to be coming out of the paper right here, or out of the board. So try to imagine it coming perpendicular straight up to the ceiling. So that's how you want to think about this third axis. If you draw it straight up to the ceiling, it would look like this. A little tiny point right there. So it would look like nothing. I just drew a, a little point right there. That's the arrowhead going straight up. So you can't really represent on two-dimensional paper what this should look like. So we do this instead. Now in terms of what are the axes, we're going with, it's a little bit weird, Y is to the right, Z is up, and X is coming out of the paper. Is that the way they're doing it in engineering class? It's not like this? You, you can do it like that. Um, so you can also put the X to the right, the Y up, and then Z's coming out of the paper. For one of the engineering ones, it was like, you could either pick your own ones, or they gave you an assigned one at some random thing, or both. Well, you set how you want your origin to be, and just work it out. So we're going to go with this for our purposes here. And what we're going to do is plot a couple of points and then see why plotting points is pretty miserable. So we'll go with some easy points on the axes. When we're in three dimensions, our points have three coordinates, so an x, y, and a z. Let's go with 2, 0, 0. We'll call that A. So plot A first. So x coordinate is 2, so this is supposed to go 2 in the x direction. So I just drew little marks on my x axis to go out 2. So 
So go B030. Zero, zero. So 3 is the Y coordinate. So there's B. And we'll do the C point as 0, zero 001. So it'll be up on the x, uh, the z axis. All right, point D. We'll go with two, three, one. All right, plot two, three, one. So I went two down the x-axis, three across over to the right on the y-axis, and then one up. And that's where the point looks like it is, at least on my graph. So that's how I got there. I did the x first, then the y, then the z. That point looks like it could have lots of other coordinates, doesn't it? What if I said the z-coordinate had to be zero? Maybe that's like one, two, or something like one, two, zero? Also, it looks like on my graph it's close to 1, 2, 0 if it's on the y-x plane. What if the z-coordinate was negative 50? Then it would probably be back quite a bit and, I don't know, maybe something else too. So you can't tell by looking really what the coordinates of the points are. So that is why graphing gets really tricky. So the best you can do is what I did, just kind of go down your three axes the right amount and hope that later on when you come back you realize where that point actually is because you have to form a 3d picture in your head which is not easy to do all right so that should be d right there <clears throat> so let's talk about the coordinate planes those are easy to draw So we'll start with the what would be the ground, which is the xy plane. And we're going to define it in set notation. So if I write out the full set builder notation, I'll write it as any point x, y, z in R3 such that what defines all points on the xy plane. What do all points on the xy plane have in common? No z. Well, everybody's got a z coordinate, but what about the z coordinate? Z will be zero, so their height is zero. So it'll look like x, y, z such that height or z coordinate is zero. So that's our set builder notation for the xy plane. Now we can do the y, z plane. Now, set builder notation, because we're almost always going to work in R2 or R3, we just skip writing the exists in R3. So I'm just going to write it X, Y, Z, and then the vertical bar such that. So what defines the Y, Z plane? X is zero. So don't go out of the paper. So X is zero. And last up, x, y, y, z, x, z. So it's x, y, z such that y coordinate equals 0. And we can draw these planes. I'm not going to draw all three. We'll just draw a few planes. So here's our axis. I'll just do the x, z plane. Well, that one will be x, z. So our y coordinate is 0. So we're not going to go any amount in the y direction. So I'll draw it in green. So I'm going to go parallel to the, axi, the x axis and then parallel to the z axis. 
it's not really centered. But that is <coughs> the plane where your Y coordinate is zero right there. So it's kind of coming out of the board, lined up with the Z axis, perpendicular to Y. So now we're going to graph some regions. So we'll start with y greater than or equal to 0. Let's go with the description of this first. What is a good way to describe all points with a y coordinate greater than or equal to 0? So we're going to cut our three-dimensional space in half, in quarters, in eighths. We're going to cut it in half, and we're basically keeping the right half when we cut it in half. So the description, we'll call it the right half space. Now how do we draw this? Very carefully. Luckily we have that XZ plane, that'll be very useful. We're going to take that XZ plane, and I want everything to the right of the XZ plane. So I'll redraw the XZ plane here. So I have my XZ plane, I want everything to the right, so I'm going to draw arrows going to the right here. So I got my plane and it's just arrows going to the right. Now <clears throat> I drew this plane like it's uh, maybe too tall and too wide. How tall and wide is this plane describing this space? Infinite. It's infinite. So if I want to be more accurate, I really should do something really annoying, like draw arrows going all over the place, but now it's going to look really ugly. And I would need arrows in the back, arrows on the bottom, and now it just looks like a total mess. So I'm not going to draw those arrows all over the place. I think that's probably enough arrows going just right there. All right, next example, z equals 2. So this is going to be a plane. How can we describe this plane? It's the xy plane centered at z2. So it's similar to the xy plane. So it's going to be a horizontal or parallel with the ground but moved up to, or shifted up to. So what I'm going to do is pick the point zero, zero, 002 and fill the point in on the plane, and then I'm going to draw the plane around that point right there. So that's our z equals 2 plane. So it's the x, y plane shifted up to. So our last region, I'm going to draw it, uh, write it in set notation because it's going to be a little more complicated than our others. So all points such that z is greater than or equal to 0. And x squared plus y squared equals 4. 
So let's start with the easy one, z squared greater than or equal to zero. So that's really similar to our first example. So we're gonna cut the space in half. What half are we taking when z is greater than or equal to zero? So we'll take the upper half, so z is a height or an altitude the way that we're drawing our axes. Oh, just made those y, z, x is coming out. All right, so I want to take, <clears throat> I'm not going to draw it in, but it's going to be the upper half plane or upper half space. All right, what about x squared plus y squared equals four? What does this equation give us? So it'll be a circle with a radius of two. It is centered at the origin, but we have to decide now we're in three dimensions. So it'll be a circle. It is centered at the origin and it will be going around the YZ plane. So how in the world do you draw a circle here? So the way I'm gonna draw it, I drew little marks that are parallel to the other axis I'm gonna draw my circle around. So I'm using the X, Y axis, or axes. So I'm gonna ignore the Z axis for a minute. I'm just drawing a circle around these two axes. So each of the tick marks I drew, they're gonna be parallel to the other axis I am using. This will help me draw a circle using perspective drawing. This is not a drawing class, but hopefully, I'm trying to make the curves tangent at those little marks that I drew. And if you practice this long enough, your circle doesn't totally suck. So something like that. It's not quite an oval because I think it's a sheared, a sheared oval would be the right word for it because it's an oval, but then you're kind of taking the top and bottom and shifting them opposite directions. So I'm going to redraw my Z axis right back through. What coordinate does every point on the circle I draw have in, what value of what coordinate does every point on that circle have in common? They have different X and Y values, Z. but they all have Z is zero. So I could draw another one of these circles up, maybe at Z equals one and Z equals two, and I get every single one in between. What I can't do is draw any below with a negative Z coordinate. So this is gonna be a cylinder this is the base of the cylinder and it goes up infinitely high. So I'm gonna draw a second one of these or maybe we'll just do arrows going up on this. That'll be a little better way to show this. So it's the infinite cylinder starting at an altitude of zero going up forever. So that's just practice drawing. Now we're going to get some distance formula going in three dimensions. So we're going distance between, I need two points, so we'll go x1, y1, z1, and x2, y2, z2. This is gonna use Pythagorean uh, relationship here. The only difference is we have an extra Z coordinate. So our distance will be square root. Now it starts out X2 minus X1 squared, just like the two dimensional. 
And then we have y2 minus y1 squared. We have a third coordinate, and it works just like the others. So z2 minus z1 squared. So that's our distance formula in three dimensions. And we're going to look at a sphere. If we look at the definition of a sphere, it's, <coughs> it has a center, and it's all points that are the same distance from the center. So that's how we can define a sphere. Very similar to a circle, except a sphere is in three dimensions. So a circle is in two dimensions, all points same distance from the center. Here we're just in three dimensions. So a sphere is all points x, y, z. that are an R, which is the radius, distance from the center. We'll use C from this, for the center. Before we did H comma K, what's after K in the alphabet? Wait, H is not even before K in the alphabet. What well, is, but it's not right before K, is it? H, I, J, K, L. I guess we'll go with the cursive L. Don't use regular L because it probably looks like a one if you read a regular L. And make sure your L doesn't look like an E either. It's gotta be kinda narrow and tall. Oh, you know what? Let's fix this. We'll use what your book uses. X not, Y not, Z not. There we go. So we have x, y, and z initial coordinates. All right, we want all points that are the same distance from the center. So the way our equation is going to look, it starts out looking like a circle in standard form, x minus the center squared plus y minus the y center squared. And then we get another z minus the z center coordinate squared equals r squared. So this is the standard form of the sphere. It looks just like the circle. So this last example we're going to describe and draw uh, the region x, y, z such that 1 is less than or equal to x squared plus y squared plus z squared is less than or equal to 3. and z is less than or equal to 0. So I have a double inequality written here. So that double inequality means there's actually two inequalities going on. Well, there's technically three, but I'll write the third one down, and it's trivial. So the first inequality, it says 1 is less than or equal to x squared plus y squared plus z squared. So that's a lower bound on x squared plus y squared plus z squared. The second inequality is x squared plus y squared plus z squared is less than or equal to 3. There is a third inequality hiding in there. It's 1 is less than or equal to 3, but that's pretty obvious. It doesn't really need to be written down. We still have that other one by itself, z less than or equal to zero. All right, why did I just describe a sphere? What are we looking at with this first equation right here? Uh, so it's a sphere with what radius and what center? So radius will be one, or square root of one. Where's the center? Origin, zero, zero, zero. 
<clears throat> it has an inequality sign. If it was equals, we would just get the sphere. It's greater than or equal to, so it's the sphere with the radius one at the origin or outside. So it's the sphere or a larger radius. The next one down is a sphere with radius three or inside. So we're inside the radius three sphere, outside the radius one sphere. So that's what the inequalities mean that we're looking at. And then think about your third inequality and do your best to draw that shape. So I drew my sphere without, or my region without putting axes on. So I didn't have to worry about that skewed part of the circle. But you can draw it either way. So if I come back to draw axes, the way I drew it, I need to draw my axis almost going straight out of the board towards us. Now the Z axis has to be the one going up, so I have negative Z uh, is where my, what shape is this? A really inefficient bowl? Like maybe one that's holding something super hot. <laughs> like a molten steel, lava, lava's cooler, so you don't burn your hand. All right, so your drawing should look something like that, and then three and three are gonna be where you're intersecting right there. I didn't really draw my negative z-axis, but I would be intersecting at negative three on the z-axis also. So that's the end of 12.1. And I think this is a good place to stop. We're going to jump into vectors next. Hopefully you remember some of the things from pre-calculus 2 class. So we're going to be going back through vectors, but we're going to go quite a bit faster.